350 years ago, a fictional man was born on paper. The name Don Juan was scratched on a manuscript by a Spanish monk, and the legend of a great lover was born. A hundred years later, a Venetian named Casanova wrote six volumes on his own life and established himself as a legendary lover as well. The two men had a common occupation, the pursuit of women. Were they great lovers or merely fools? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Through the ages, Legends of love and lovers have captured the imaginations of storytellers and their audiences. Platonic lovers, selfish and selfless lovers, star-crossed lovers, all have had their expression in music, drama, literature, and dance. In all the annals of fiction, one character stands alone as the symbol of sensuality triumphant. He was the titled character in a 17th century drama called The Playboy of Seville, a character whose very existence is based on the seduction of women. In the story, he was a nobleman, handsome, intelligent, and cynical. His list of female conquests totaled a thousand and three. When warned that someday he would pay for his lust, he would answer, there's plenty of time for that. His name, Don Juan. The beautiful Donna Anna is to be married to the Marquis de Mota, a friend of Don Juan's. Tonight, she's expecting a visit from her future husband. Don Juan has intercepted her invitation and in the darkness is planning to enjoy her favors. At this moment, he is under royal order of banishment for a similar affair. This is his way of having a last bit of sport before leaving Seville. Was this an act of love? or simply a cruel deception. This time, the plan failed. Donna Anna's screams awakened her father, the illustrious commander of the Order of Calatrava. escaped punishment by having someone else blamed for the killing. The soul of the commander would seek its vengeance. A statue erected to honor Don Juan's victim came to life and invited him to dinner. The meal was elegantly served and the conversation was friendly. To round out the evening, the statue proposed a toast. Although it was a murderer that went to hell for his sins, the legend of a great lover was born. A hundred years later, that legend would spring to life. In the 1700s, a man appeared whose very aim in life seemed to be the enactment of the Don Juan role. A man who said of himself, the chief business of my life 
is to indulge my senses. I felt myself born for the fair sex. He was a lawyer, conman, writer, gentleman, and scoundrel. 18th century Venice was a hotbed of extremes, dignity and debauchery, brilliance and stupidity, extravagance and poverty. This man was the embodiment of it all. He pursued women constantly, and like Don Juan, he made no class distinction. Born illegitimate, he became a self-appointed nobleman. His name was Giacomo Casanova. Was he truly a lover? If so, then certainly Venice was his appropriate birthplace. In the lexicon of romance, Venice is a name to conjure with. Unexcelled in its beauty, here the balladeers sing of their great loves and the poets come for inspiration. Here Casanova lived by his wits, dabbling in Kabbalah, an ancient mysticism invoking the powers of God and the cosmos. Was he a true believer, or did he use mysticism to exploit the gullible? Casanova's reputation as charlatan could stand against that of Count St. Germain, who claimed several reincarnations, and Count Cagliostro, who claimed to turn lead into gold and to extend life indefinitely. Yet Casanova also held his own in conversations with two popes, Catherine the Great, Voltaire, Rousseau, and Benjamin Franklin. He gambled heavily, and his sensual appetite was expensive. Under constant financial pressure, he used various talents and schemes to replenish his purse, but his profits were soon squandered. He spent his winnings on women, and more often, consoled himself in a new affair when he lost. In Amsterdam, he urged financiers to issue insurance on a ship believed lost at sea. He claimed to have a cabalistic prophecy that the ship would be safe. Actually, Casanova had little to lose. If the venture was a failure, he would simply leave town. The ship turned up safely. Sir Thomas Hope, believing in Casanova's mystic knowledge, had taken the gamble. Hope profited handsomely. He shared his profits with Casanova and offered him a substantial business position. Why did he refuse? Was he insecure about his talent for magic, fearful that failure in future prophecies might expose him as a fraud? Or was it because he was about to embark on his most larcenous and erotic adventure? For Giacomo Casanova, the time was now ripe for the climactic scene in a bizarre scheme. The lady was Madame Dureth. Her wealth was surpassed only by her imagination. Being a sincere believer in the Kabbalah, Madame Dureth wished to be reborn as a man. Only as a male would she be allowed to commune with the Kabbalistic spirits. Using a young friend as an accomplice, Casanova was to invoke the proper magical environment. Then, he would father the male child, which would carry the spirit of Madame Dureth. In return, Casanova would gain control of her estate. The evening was a strange mixture of fantasy, imagination, and eroticism. To conclude, Casanova was to spend the night outdoors, waiting for a cosmic sign of success. When the sign came, it was loud and clear, and it frightened Casanova out of his wits.
Although Casanova was to inherit Madame Durif's estate, her daughter managed to gain control of her assets, thereby doing Casanova out of his reward. Madame Durif was intended to be a victim, but since she enjoyed the full measure of Casanova's services, and he enjoyed very little of her money, we're left to wonder who was the user and who was used. Venice was controlled by a governor who left the daily affairs of state to three inquisitors. For them, Casanova meant trouble. They were his financial double dealings, his mystic activities, and his scandals with the wives of royalty. In 1755, when he was 30 years old, he was escorted to the royal palace. This was not a social invitation. His talent for intrigue and scandal had left a trail of enemies. Now, he was caught in his own web. The top floor of the palace was a prison. Here, without trial and for unspecified crimes, he was locked up, possibly for life. A painful prospect for a man who so desperately needed the company of women. Because of the metal roof over his cell, the prison was known as the Leads. No prisoner had ever escaped. While exercising in the prison hall, Casanova found some hope. The metal bar took a month of work until it was sharp enough, and then his plan went into action. After 15 months of imprisonment, he climbed out onto this roof on the night of October 1st, 1756. Finding a workman's ladder, he lowered himself past his own barred window and entered the business offices below. His intention was to wait until morning and walk out the front door when the palace was opened. He didn't have to wait long. He was seen at the window by a passerby who took him for an important nobleman locked in by mistake. The front door was unlocked and Casanova was free. That was Casanova's own version of his escape. Was it true? There are some who say it was a fiction, a product of his own fertile imagination. The disbelievers suggest that he may simply have bribed the guards and he was released. Personally, I prefer the romantic version. In any case, he would now be exiled from his beautiful Venice for 18 years, the Venice that he loved so much. To Paris, to Holland, to Rome, Milan, Marseille, London. Running, conniving, debauching. The pursuit of women resumed. Several times he considered marriage, but cooled on the idea in time to avoid the commitment. On the one occasion when he came close to taking the vows, circumstances took a strange turn. The young lady was named Leonilda. Casanova asked for her hand and she agreed. Her widowed mother was sent for to complete the arrangements. Now, the ghost of his own past intervened. The girl's mother was Lucrezia D'Antoni, with whom he'd had an affair some years earlier. The young lady who was 16, was his own daughter. For a short time, he was grief-stricken, but very soon consoled himself by renewing his affair with the mother of his almost bride. He arrived in Florence, alone and empty-handed. 
He was granted asylum by Duke Leopold, who told him he would be welcome if he stayed out of trouble. His good behavior lasted two weeks. He came to the rescue of an actress being abused by a theater manager. Once again, his adoration of the gentle sex was his downfall. He was reported by the manager and expelled from Florence. In the endless string of assignations, flirtations, intrigues, call them what you will, the question remains, was there love? The answer is yes. In Cesena, Casanova met a young lady who had left Rome to escape from an unhappy marriage. She was bright and beautiful, and they fell truly in love. For several months, they traveled together, reveling in the glow of romance. Although Henriette cared deeply for Casanova, she was a shrewd judge of character. Casanova was not a man with whom one could build a future. Her message read, Tu oublieras aussi Henriette. You will also forget Henriette. The next day, her coachman returned with a one-word message. Goodbye. A legend is a story handed down to us from the past containing an element of truth. Although it is a fact that these two legendary lovers could each claim a thousand affairs, are we to assume that quantity is a valid measure when applied to love? In the case of Don Juan, the question is dealt with in a poignant and telling manner by author Edmund Rostand. Having been cast into hell by the statue of the commander, Don Juan was greeted by the devil, who had been expecting him and welcomed him. The devil explained that all who come to hell are assigned a role to reflect their performance on earth. Don Juan asked what his role was to be. It was the suit of a court jester, a fool. Don Juan complained there must be some mistake. No mistake, said the devil. Put it on. You will be our clown. You will make a perfect fool. Don Juan argued that he was a great lover, a man of a thousand and three conquests. The devil had a suggestion. If Juan could remember one, just one of his supposed loves, he could avoid the fool's role. The bargain was struck and the women were summoned. Now, the strange trial began. I remember. How could I ever forget our beautiful night in Paris? You are Arabella. No one. It was Rome. I am Sarah. Only one. I only have to remember one. And so it went. One by one they came, and time after time he failed. This time, I'm certain, I will not be made a fool. 
It was Madrid. You are Esmeralda. No one. We were in Malaga. I am Kara. The sad parade continued until... Yes, said the devil. A real tear. This one truly loved you. Offered you a great and lasting love. Finally, accepting the truth of his life, Don Juan said, Give me the suit. Giacomo Casanova, great lover or great fool? By his own admission, the number of his liaisons equaled that of Don Juan. Ironically, there is evidence that he contributed to the libretto of Don Giovanni, the Mozart opera based on the Don Juan story. Yet there is an outstanding difference between the two men. While Don Juan left bitterness in his wake, Casanova's women maintained tender feelings for him long after the passion of their affairs had faded. An enduring testimony to the generosity of Casanova's character. If a lover can be defined as one who enjoys the giving as well as the taking, then surely Giacomo Casanova must be granted the title of lover.